Good morning, everyone. Happy New Year and welcome to the Angry Astronaut. I decided to open up the new year with something I think that everybody could get excited about, and that is a mission to Mars or rather a little bit different mission to Mars in terms of its configuration, its objectives, and how we might achieve such a thing on a limited budget. Now, this is not 100% my idea. As a matter of fact, 90% of it really isn't my idea. I got this from a scholarly article uh, that I was emailed, actually. I receive these things periodically, and it's very interesting indeed. However, it was done a while ago before the advent of Starship. So what I decided to do was to update this proposal utilizing Starship and more importantly something that I call a micro Starship. Not a mini Starship. That's something that uh, Robert Zubrin talked about. This would be even smaller still. And why would it need to be so small? Well because we would only be talking about a crew of two. Now, before I get any further into that, I'm going to give you a quick update on something that I talked about yesterday. If you don't want to hear about this, just skip to this point. I put out an appeal to try to get back to Cornwall for the launch to do right by the people who spent all of this money to get me to the UK in the first place and to keep me there. And frankly, I've raised to my great amazement, about 90%, almost 90% of what I'm looking for. Really another one to $200 should do it. Should be enough to keep me in Britain for 10 days, even if there's a scrub or something like that. I should be able to remain in Britain and cover the launch. Is this is something you'd like to support, Patreon, PayPal, the best ways, and those are linked in the description. Let's move on. So I'm sure a lot of you are wondering, now wait a minute, two people? I mean, this is so unambitious, not very exciting. Why the hell would we want a crew of two? What could we possibly accomplish with a crew of two? Well, there's a lot of compelling reasons as to why our first mission to Mars, a scouting mission, if you will, would be best served by as small of a crew as possible. And we're going to cover all of that in just a moment. Subscribe! So the initial part of my mission, okay, well, this isn't really my idea for the most part. Most of this was created by a fellow named J. Mark Salati, and also by a fellow named Miguel Gurea. And his idea, by the way, is called Mars Direct 3.0. I have a video that I created about his idea linked at the end of this video. And frankly, I think it's probably a better idea than mine, but hey, I'm going to take my best shot at it. Anyway, the beginning of this mission starts out pretty much like a traditional Starship mission. That is to say, Starship makes its way to low Earth orbit. However, it is at this point that the similarity ends, and there's a reason for that. The Mars mission, as proposed by SpaceX and Elon Musk, requires lots and lots of launches in order to fuel Starship up sufficiently in order to get its massive amount of cargo all the way to Mars. At least 10 to 12 refueling missions, although he talks about 5 or 6. But as I've mentioned before, if you fail to fill Starship up completely, then you're going to have propellant slosh and the vehicle is going to be very difficult to control. The best way to proceed with any mission with Starship, or frankly any vessel that you're trying to re 
free fuel is to fill it all the way up to minimize propellant slosh and to make vehicle control a lot more straightforward. So we're probably talking 10 to 12 refueling missions. So instead of doing that, instead of sending something as big and as heavy as Starship all the way to Mars, instead you have a smaller vehicle deployed inside Starship's fairing a micro starship, if you will. Now, this is the mini starship, as proposed by Robert Zubrin and also by Miguel Correa. Mine is a little bit different. The first component of the micro starship is the main propulsion stage. However, you would only use this for descent and ascent from the Martian surface. We'll get into the details of that a little bit later. In addition to that, you have a habitable module for only two people, but it would still be quite sizable, nine meters in diameter, simply because Starship's fairing is nine meters in diameter, so it would be pretty sizable. This would be used both in transit and also for the mission on the surface. On top of that, you would also have a propulsion stage for trans-Earth injection. It would come already filled with methylox brought from Earth. I'll get into the reasons why we have that in just a moment as well. You would also have a number of containers which would carry both the in-situ resource utilization equipment to make methylox on the surface of Mars and also to make breathable oxygen and other necessities, and you would also have a container for a collapsible Mars rover. We'll get into that in a moment also. And then finally, you have a re-entry capsule for return to Earth. All of this seems to be adding a lot of extra complexity. Why not just use the micro starship for the whole thing, where there's a lot of good reasons for that, and as I say, we'll be getting into them right now. The proposed mission has four total launches with two crews of two astronauts each. The four launches are comprised of two spacecraft or two micro starships, along with two propulsion stages in order to drive them from Earth to Mars. These propulsion stages could also be carried inside starship fairings, so you'd be looking at a total of four starship launches for two separate missions, that's not too bad, and you could actually implement or integrate nuclear propulsion into this scenario by using a nuclear propulsion stage for the micro starship instead of a conventional one reducing the transit time down to 90 days. However, we're just going to assume that we're using chemical propulsion. So once the propulsion stages push the micro starship towards Mars, it will take about six months for them to reach their destination. Oh, by the way, each micro starship contains enough provisions for four astronauts, and the reason you're doing this is if a problem comes up with one of the spacecraft, the second has adequate space and provisions to take all four astronauts back to Earth. It would be a little cramped, and they might have to stretch their provisions, but nevertheless, they could do it. This, by the way, was a concept first put forward by Werner von Braun a very long time ago. So once the two micro starships arrive in Mars orbit, they utilize aero capture in order to reduce speed and eventually enter into a stable orbit around the red planet. Once they've done this, the front part, that is to say the nose of the spacecraft, separates from the rest of the micro starship, leaving sort of a snub-nosed looking spacecraft to land on the surface. So that means you would have the propulsion stage and the re-entry capsule left in Mars orbit, along with everything else that you don't need to set down on Mars and to explore the Martian surface, which means you would just have the containers that you need in order to make use of Mars resources and also for the collapsible rover, the habitation module, and the propulsion stage, a small snub-nosed spacecraft to set down on the surface of Mars, and it wouldn't weigh a great deal either. 
The life support system would weigh three and a half metric tons, and that includes 500 kilograms for an additional two astronauts. Then you would have crew accommodations and consumables, and that would be 1,555 kilograms for two astronauts, or double that for four astronauts. You would also have EVA equipment, massing about 200 kilograms, communications equipment, 320 kilograms, and also power production. In other words, a solar power system capable of producing about 30 kilowatts worth of energy, 1.2 metric tons. A thermal control system of 400 kilograms, the structure being about 3 metric tons, and then finally spares or extra equipment massing about 1 metric ton. The total weight of the micro starship, at least the vessel that would be sitting down on the Martian surface, would only be 16.7 metric tons, plus the propellant you would require in order to land, and then you would have to manufacture enough propellant on the Martian surface in order to get back into Mars orbit. However, since this is such a small spacecraft, again, all you would need for two astronauts, you wouldn't need a whole lot of propellant and oxidizer in order to get back into Mars orbit. You see, one of the biggest unknowns when it comes to a future Mars mission is how much energy is it going to take in order to produce sufficient methalox in order to get back. And keep in mind, you only have a limited amount of time before your astronauts are going to reach their next launch window. Now, of course, you can try to produce all of this propellant and oxidizer before the mission even arrives, send robot missions first. However, that adds a lot of of additional complexity and expense to the mission. Right now, we're trying to do this as simply and as inexpensively as possible, which means you want to produce as little propellant as you need on the Martian surface, just enough to get into orbit. Remember that you have a trans-Earth injection stage still waiting for you in orbit that has enough fuel loaded in order to get the mission back to Earth. Our two Martian explorers would have a very, very long stay ahead of them. We're talking 550 days for these two people. However, there are a great number of missions in the past that have precedent for these kinds of long stays being shared by only two people. They would have to obviously be extremely skilled individuals. We would need people who had primary skills in chemistry, thermodynamics, mechanics, and electricity in order to properly operate and maintain the equipment on the spacecraft, and they would also have to perform a long training phase for the use of onboard systems and other relevant domains, especially medicine, biology, and astronautics. And finally, a doctor with long training in other domains might be preferred. Now keep in mind, you would have four astronauts, not two, if you're sending two separate missions, which means they could have other scientific training, such such as geology and exobiology. So with four total astronauts, you would have a pretty good cross-section of skills, and the only reason you would only have two astronauts is if something happened to one of the missions. In addition to that, you would also have unpressurized rovers for both missions in order to extend the exploration radius of each expedition. You wouldn't have a pressurized rover because it would simply weigh too much. You would want rovers that would be both collapsible, take up the minimum amount of space, and also the minimum amount of mass. Keep in mind that these are only scouting missions. This is not a full-fledged colonization mission or anything like that. This is just our first mission to Mars that we're keeping costs down to a minimum, weight down to a minimum, and risk down to a minimum. Now keep in mind that the 16.7 metric ton estimate that I gave a little while ago is only for the ascent mass of the spacecraft. In addition to that, it would also carry 3 metric tons worth of excavation systems, 1.1 metric tons worth of water extraction systems, 2.8 tons for a saboteur reactor and electrolysis unit, and 3.85 tons worth of additional power systems 
all of that mostly used to produce propellant on the Martian surface. And even so, you would only really need to produce about 70 metric tons worth of propellant in order to get the ship back into Martian orbit. Once you reach Mars orbit, as I said before, you would only be using the propellant stage that you brought with you in order to get you the rest of the way back to Earth. Now, none of this would be necessary if you could produce enough propellant and oxidizer on the Martian surface to get the whole thing back before you left, but this is designed to have the maximum amount of safety built into the system. So if for some reason that the in-situ resource utilization doesn't work out as well as you were hoping, that means that you're going to have enough propellant and a backup propulsion system in orbit in order to get you the rest of the way back to Earth. A lot of safety built into this plan. In addition to exploring, the astronauts could also experiment with a number of different unique in-situ resource utilization methods in order to extend their life support. For example, there are certain types of bacteria on our planet that consume perchlorates and produce oxygen as a byproduct. As a matter of fact, a proof-of-concept model for an emergency oxygen supply system for astronauts was recently created, whereby you would only have to put a few kilograms worth of Martian regolith into a bag, along with the enzymes produced by these bacteria, and it would produce enough oxygen to last an astronaut for an entire hour. On top of that, you could also try to produce more oxygen by extracting it from the Martian atmosphere, kind of similar to the MOXIE system, and also experiment with methods of growing food and also extracting additional drinking water water from available Martian resources. The advantage that all of these processes would have is that the astronauts would not have their survival dependent on their success. They would have enough supplies available so that if even almost all of the ISRU systems were to fail, they would still be able to get back to Earth orbit without any problems on their existing supplies. And by the way, once they reached their spacecraft, or rather their return stage waiting for them in Mars orbit. If they had managed to produce surplus propellant on the Martian surface, they could use that fuel to explore the surroundings in Martian orbit, that is to say Phobos and Deimos, to determine whether or not those moons might be useful for future colonization efforts. Lots of different alternatives available to this mission if you only have two astronauts and the relatively small amount of provisions and supplies necessary for their survival. Yes, two astronauts cannot accomplish as much as four or six or twelve, but nevertheless, they do have certain unique advantages when you're talking about a small-scale scouting mission. Then once the ascent stage had rendezvoused with the TEI stage, that is to say the stage that's designed only to drive the spacecraft back to Earth, the propulsion stage for descent and ascent would be left behind, leaving only the habitable module, the propulsion stage for TEI, and the reentry capsule. And once that spacecraft arrived in Earth orbit, the two astronauts, or four if there had been some kind of mishap during the mission would board the re-entry capsule and re-enter Earth's atmosphere for a safe splashdown. Yes, this involves expendability on the part of a great deal of the spacecraft. However, there are quite a number of other advantages. Keep in mind that the traditional Starship mission would require 10 to 12 launches in order to get Starship all the way to the Red Planet. Indeed, even the Mars Direct mission that Robert Zubrin came up with with would require enough Starship refueling missions in order to get many Starship all the way to translunar injection. This scenario only requires two launches of Starship, one to deploy the micro Starship and one to deploy the propulsion stage, which means for four total Starship launches, you could send two expeditions to Mars as opposed to 10 to 13 launches in order to just send one. 
done. There are a number of very interesting advantages to this mission, and I have to admit, I find it very compelling, and I hope you enjoyed it too. Please like this video, please subscribe to my channel, once again, pushing very steadily towards 100,000 subscribers. I have never grown this fast. Thank you so much for your support, and also please check the description for various ways to keep supporting this content, and as always, stay angry about space.